I started with the mentality that most people have. Video games are probably bad for you and they're addictive. And I found a body of research that really pointed to the opposite of that. So I got drawn to the idea, like many people do, is video games as a therapy delivery mechanism. And then I started to realize as I looked into it, they weren't just a therapy delivery mechanism. They could be a therapeutic. Ryan Douglas is the visionary co-founder of Deepwell DTX, a company that merges digital therapeutics with immersive gaming to address critical mental health issues. Ryan has decades of experience developing innovative medical devices and is now working hard to get mental health games widely accepted by the medical community. Like many people, Ryan didn't start off believing that video games could be good for you. Join us as we explore the intersection of gaming and healing with digital therapeutics pioneer, Ryan Douglas. Hey everyone. I'm live here with Ryan Douglas. Welcome, Ryan. Oh, thank you. So let's start with some background. First of all, what's a therapy designer? It's a new title that I've been using since I came into doing this work with video games to help people understand that there are these various roles that are uh, maturing or coming into being as we look at the intersection of medicine and media. So uh, like a game designer designs your game and has a team of folks from art all the way through production that are doing their work for them. Therapy designers at that intersection of the science, really the engineering and medicine to figure out where the therapeutic aspects are in that game. And really importantly, the way Deepwell handles this is work in service of the game designer. Instead of that more reverse thing we saw in gamification, the designer was brought in to gamify something that was already maybe pre-cooked or pre-canned. The therapy designer's job is to look at the therapeutic present it to the game designer relative to gameplay. And then if that isn't working for the game designer, if it is not fitting in the play loops, if it's not fun, it's to go out and find more opportunities for therapy. At the same time, it's to hold the line and the games do need to be therapeutic. So it's about finding that, that confluence between what's fun, which is really up to the game designer and how they can use the mechanic and which mechanics are out there, which therapeutics will fit into a game scenario. That's a pretty interesting and unique point of view. How did you come up with that? It's probably the results of what, decades of experience working in digital therapeutics? It's funny, I didn't get it defined till about three years ago. It's not till we tried this confluence with medicine and media that I really maybe even understood what I'd been doing for over 20 years. But sitting at the intersection between medicine, engineering and the market was where I always was. Of that I got all sorts of titles for that, chief technical officer, CEO at various points and times and stuff like that. But I always stayed really resident or close to the products. No matter what role I had, I was about getting things in people's hands that, that could make a difference. I think it was really interesting for us to try to merge medicine and media. There's a lot of learnings in the last three, four years for Deepwell. Very symbiotic from the ability to help people and really codependent on one another to make a digital therapeutic work. But such different industries. Everything had a different term. We were looking for who's the project manager. People are pointing at somebody called the line producer and every one of us in medicine is going, well, what is the line producer? Like these sorts of things facilitated a whole new language for us to figure out how to cooperate and work together. Very different development cycles, very different cultures. And so that title, many other things are lessons learned as we try to find this intersection between media and medicine. So how did you come to focus on this intersection of games and medicine? and get all in on immersive therapy. From the whole background that you have, you're all in on this. I'm definitely all in on it. And I was not planning on being all in on it at all. We were in Minneapolis, St. Paul, where all of the big med tech was happening. So we were asked to get involved and ended up commercializing 27 medical devices over a span of 17 years. Everything from home-based therapies for folks with survivors from breast cancer, kids with cystic fibrosis to ablation-based surgical devices, vapor-based ablation for women's health, just a wide range of things in a period of time that really resonated with us as a technical group of people. After we got those devices sold or, or in the market, every one of them went profitable, Amy Joe. So that was catching a lot of attention. And there was an opportunity to sell next. And this was the opportunity of kind of that exit of a lifetime. It's a five times or five lifetimes of money sort of thing. And I was at the place of really happy with what we had done, but had thought a lot about this intersection of why we'd been successful. And we always looked for things that were affordable. Uh, that meant they would reach a reimbursement or an audience in a way that they could pay for it. They were accessible. That meant they did things that were required within the field. So 
They solve problems that needed to be solved in a way that, that the market would allow them to be solved, which includes affordability. And there was compliance. It was this idea that people would do it, especially in the home-based arena. We worked a lot to simplify therapies, get them in the home, and move away from pharmaceutical solutions when we could, the things that would more induce the body to respond naturally to, to the effects of, of the device. And so I mean, it was really important for us to have this accessibility and affordability to care. And as this really big check was getting written and those of us that had done this from the beginning were getting a chance to move on, I was questioning about that really compliance to care. Had Once we got these things in people's homes, were they really using them? And I had evidence that they weren't, that, that there was times where we would get these things in home and they just were ending up more like a treadmill, right? Where it was a great idea and people wanted it, but when it came down to doing it, it wasn't happy, happening. So I was worried about the compliance and I was thinking a lot about that. Right around that time, uh, a friend of mine was exiting from a company as well in video games and going through, I'd say a similar sort of situation where wondering whether the video games that this company had built, the things that they had done, if there was real super value in what they had done and started passing me a lot of study. One of the games was Fall Guys. Uh, Fall Guys was an amazing success during the pandemic. And I was watching this mental health emergency get rolling and concerned about that. And Fall Guys was really getting the sort of feedback that we used to get off some of our devices, that people were using this as a lifeline. It caused me to dig in deep. I didn't have the next turn team anymore, so I used my family and started digging into the research that had already been done. I started with the mentality that most people have. Video games are probably bad for you, and they're addictive, and how could this possibly be? And I found a body of research, and a significant body, 800 to 1,000 studies that had been done over 20 years that really pointed to the opposite of that. And unfortunately, sometimes it looked like they had been sponsored or built in a way to suggest that video games were potentially not useful or potentially even harmful, or sometimes a cause of certain societal issues or violence issues and things like that. But they, the results just weren't bearing out that way. So what really caught my attention was this intersection between how therapeutic they could be. And it wasn't compliant, it was compelling. People wanted to do it. So I got drawn to the idea like many people do is video games as a therapy delivery mechanism, maybe a way to make what I'd done better. And then I started to realize as I looked into it, they weren't just a therapy delivery mechanism, they could be a therapeutic. And that drew me in considerably. I reached out to the gaming community and the folks that responded back, folks now that are, many of which are tied to Deepwell and who were at the top of their game, how much they had always felt and known this, but hadn't been able to represent it maybe as scientifically that just drew me right in and staring at the mental health crisis, watching what was going on with COVID and knowing that it was going to get a lot worse before it got better. We worked on white therapy and really won that market in North America. So we understood where depression was at in North America 20 years ago, worked on neural stimulators that would have had a lot to do with mental health as well as management pain. And so we knew the climate we were looking at and here you are with a 50 year medical emergency or if you will, mental health emergency. And then COVID starts. A lot of people think that's the start of the mental health emergency. It wasn't. It was really the fastest accelerant to a thing that had been causing problems for almost 50 years. The World Health Organization was telling us if we don't get control of this situation by 2030, this is going to be the leading cause of mortality. Meanwhile, on an international level, 2% of our health spend was on mental health. And we weren't even able to talk about it. So this just was so compelling to get drawn in and think, we might have something here that is that Venn diagram, that affordability of care, that accessibility to care and compliance taken all up to the level of compelling was just something that I, I needed to see through and see how far we could take. Awesome. One of the things you and I talked about a few weeks ago was the problems that you've seen so far with mental health games, treatment games, et cetera. So digital therapeutics is very exciting. The dynamics you just outlined with the pandemic, mental health, clearly driving a lot of change. But people have been attempting to do digital therapeutics for a long time, decades, including brain games and Achille and various other games. Absolutely. Trying to make things in the games that weren't games to start with. To be fair, there are some games out there that started as games. They didn't you know, start as therapy. They started as games. Not every game is a good game. I mean, I'm sure this is part of your journey in terms of 
discovering games, discovering the magic of games. And then as you get deeper and deeper and you become sophisticated, you start to look at games with a different eye. So what lens do you see that through? Yeah. I mean, there's so many learnings there. Backing up when I was saying like just taking games off the board, because remember from my world, they weren't really seen as therapeutic, right? If you live in the medical device world and the pharma world, even when I started working on this, we have a venture studio that sits above this that does new generation or next generation neurological care. And while I was working on the games, I was working on implants for the brain and spinal surgery, robotics and stuff like that. And when I was in the med crowd, a lot of people would almost chuckle and be like, hey, how's your games company over there? At? And they weren't hearing me early on that I thought it could be the most significant intervention that I'd been involved with. So yeah, there was this background. I, I think that Video games have suffered from this thing for a very long time, and so is medical device. And this is what's really led to a gamification challenge for me, which is from the game's perspective, people want this attraction that we've seen over 50 years of games, but they don't really have respect or knowledge for what it takes to make a good video game, that it is both art and science. So the highest likelihood is that the best game designers in this world are probably the best behavioral scientists or observational behavioral scientists we have in the 21st century. They have a process and they have a way of doing it. And it's not gamification. It starts at this kernel of play that is worked and worked until it feels like it's something that is really attractive, often outside of the digital environment, then put into the digital environment where it becomes not very fun. And the finding fun process, the being at 90% in a game and having to work all the way through that being an amazingly attractive game loop or a series of game loops. I don't think there was a lot of tolerance for coming to understand that. I don't think that the experts were consulted. And I saw that really in digital therapeutics a little bit too, from the medical device standpoint, we saw folks rush in early on with gamification, with digitalization of therapies, many of which really didn't take lessons back from med device either, or come up by people like me, talk about how reimbursement might actually work, talk about what it might look like to truly be therapeutic for some, somebody. We saw a lot of early plays for that were based in cornering a market and, and medicine is a market that is hard to corner. And when you look at what's really powerful about media and games in particular is that they're ubiquitous. There's so many of them that there's attachment points for many different people. And in that way, a chance for them to see themselves in a narrative and a story and a character and potentially then progress through something that could be very th therapeutic for them. And that doesn't happen well if you're trying to build a single game to corner a market something like that. I saw a lot of misunderstanding about what a secondary game mechanic was, that badging, scoring, and social was the way to enhance good gameplay. It wasn't gameplay. And so I think we saw a lot of that in, in the gamification side. It feels to me like, Amy Joe, that we saw folks maybe more from the media or tech side trying to grab a hold of medicine without a lot of knowledge. Folks from the scientific and medical side trying to grab a hold of gaming and gamification without a lot of knowledge and not a true intersection between these two disciplines in a way that we could get the best out of both of them. I'd love to pick up the thread on the regulatory environment and how important it is to validate these therapies and get them not just prescribed, but covered by insurance. It's one of the things that everyone in digital therapeutics is aiming at, wrestling with, confronting. And you've definitely wrestled with this as well. Yep. We've cleared a lot of devices and we're working on this right now. Deep well. I think the first thing that happens is people get confused between the clearance that the FDA gives you and getting a reimbursement code and being able to get that paid for as a therapeutic. And we've seen that happen with several companies right now, some of which have gone public, have gone out and pushed this idea, the build it and they will come model. The thing I talk a lot about is you know, paratherapeutics after 11 years, as they were closing their doors. Their CEO put out a statement saying, did you know that you could have a very viable therapeutic and uh, insurers don't have to pay? And, and I say in some talks, a little bit tongue in cheek, yeah, and, uh, Corey, I, I did know, and so should you before you take $140 million because that really slows down an industry. So we see this big disconnect between, first of all, understanding what does it mean to get cleared by the FDA? What does it mean to get reimbursed and what levels of reimbursement you're going after? And we also see that the market is upside down. So today the FDA is only really willing to clear a video game as a prescriptive device. We've seen that happen a couple of times, but there is no reimbursement for it. So that puts a real disconnect on the care. What we're working with the agency to do is clear it as an over-the-counter device so folks could choose to get a hold of it themselves. Even though it's a more sophisticated approval, it can reduce the cost of sustaining those games 
in the market. And we have to do that level of innovation. We have to drop the cost of these being medical devices because there isn't reimbursement today. And that's going to come next over a period of time. I was just meeting with somebody while I was at I, IVR. And he's a wonderful individual, works at United Healthcare and was very clear. He was talking specifically about ADHD and he was just very clear about their position, which they had for years before a company took this public and pushed this along. He advised that company, he said, Ritalin is nine cents a day. It's nine cents a day. And so if you're going to come up with a digital therapeutic that's a thousand dollars a month, we're probably not going to talk. That's not how we work. So understanding that we have to get the FDA to agree to these things, agree that they're available publicly and that we can use the words. What the FDA really gives us is the permission to use the words like stress, anxiety, and depression. And then we got to get busy working with reimbursement to show them value. And that's how you get things reimbursed. You show them that what you've come up with costs less and is more effective. Not the other way around, is more effective and potentially costs less. That's not how insurance works. Dislike it, I do, but it is the reality. That's really interesting. What about therapies that are meant to work congruently with drugs? Yeah, so that is just, you've just jumped to what I think is the most interesting thing I'm seeing as we are studying these games right now. It looks to me, now I'm going to tell you theoretically about a mechanism of action because this is all about the brain. And if anybody tries to tell you that they know how the brain works, right away, you know, you're talking to someone who's not coming to the level because whether we're talking about some of the most sophisticated pharmaceuticals that we take today for mental health or therapies, we don't know exactly what's going on. We have theories, we have theoretical mechanisms of action. But what it looks to me is happening in some of these games is we're able to literally settle people down. And that means more than just relieve their stress on a moment to moment level, but systemic stress. This thing that is really has stress has like a 57% negative impact on the, on. So if you are truly a chronically stressed person, you could expect more than half the time that you're going to get physically sick as well. It's, it's a big deal. We don't talk a lot about it. Games have this ability to bring that stress level down, specifically certain types of games that are designed in a certain way. What seems to be happening when we're doing that is that we downregulate immune function as well. We don't build so many of those killer T cells that are out there looking to attack anything, and they will attack our own bodies as well. We see that in all sorts of different conditions, eczema and arthritis and various bowel diseases and these sorts of things. It's our own immune system coming after us. So we can downregulate that, and that puts us in a place where we're more available for therapy. So what it looks like we can do is reduce the dosage of drugs. This is super important because a lot of those drugs, especially the new things that are coming out, the biologics that are solving a lot of these problems for us in immunotherapies, for instance, they have a carcinogenic component to them. And so if we can get them down in dosage with the same level of effect, we can have a much more robust therapeutic. You're talking about the U-shaped curve. Exactly. About how a little bit of something can be very good for you and more of it can be not good for you at all. Could you explain that to our listeners? It's such an important concept from science and in what you're doing and what we're talking about, it's very grounding to understand that. On the boundary conditions of anything therapeutic, right? If I'm trying to figure out if something is therapeutic, when I was working on light therapies, exactly, I'd look at the boundary conditions. So the extreme, what's it like to have no light in your life? What's it like to have constant light in your life? On those boundary conditions of anything therapeutic, you will find harm. And so... That gives you a U-shaped response and curve as well, where harm at the top here. And as we come into the middle, we find more and more of a therapeutic situation. For the lesser of the angle of that U-shape, the more therapeutic opportunity we have. When something's very tight, like fentanyl, for instance, that's an important therapeutic, but you cannot be messing around with it. Um, just a grain of it can go in the wrong direction. So when we see a nice wide open U, that's an opportunity for treatment and therapeutics. And what we see that games do is they come in and they make that you wider for other therapies. That's a really good way of thinking about it. You are setting up studios, you're set, you're co-creating these teams, and you've got this idea that therapy should report into games. That is how DeepWell is set up all the way to, you'll notice I'm not the CEO of DeepWell. Our CEO is a career CEO. I have a chairman role that sits over the, the whole venture studio, but in DeepWell, I am the therapy designer. And I report to some amazing people who have been like Jeffrey Sang, who you've worked with before. He's our product officer. He is a top level game designer and 
he's out there. We've got a new build today. I'm going to see it. People have been testing for a couple of days. I'm going to see it next. I am not the first in the door. I am not the answer about how this will play out. I'm the answer about whether or not the laugh mechanics I provided him have been appropriately put into the game in a way that they'll be therapeutic, right? And we've been working on this. This one little game that should have been six to eight months has also been this intersection of learning where we've been at it for a couple of years because we're finding that balance back and forth. And we've had to move the teams around and, and get folks that were really, truly wanting to work on this as well, right? It's, this is not using medicine or potentially positioning medicine as a way to sell more games. It's going to do that. It's going to cut through the noise. It definitely helps with the discoverability. We're sitting on the precipice of the first ever over-the-counter treatment for mental health ever. There's never been one approved. And it won't be amazing if the first one's a video game. So we're right there. But to get it right, we've had to go back and forth many times to try to find a mechanic that the agency understands, a therapeutic that really is effective for people, and gameplay that can support it in a way that folks feel like they're playing. Because if you're not playing, the formula is not working. If you can feel like you're deeply involved in therapy at that moment, it's rocket math, right? And this is the dream of 25 years ago. We'll make it look like a video game and therefore you'll learn faster, do more. We already know that's not working. It's been a, it's been a lot of work. And I, as far as we can tell, the only way it's going to work, if your therapeutic delivery mechanism is the game and your game is itself primarily therapeutic, and the only way that happens is it was somebody is heavily involved to a flow state, engaged in those game loops in a way that they are heavily attracted, that's going to have to be led by a game designer. So let's dig into those first two things you said, a mechanic that the agency understands and that's truly effective. That's right. Now, if we pull back a little with our lens and think about how digital therapeutics worked and has worked, how it's gotten staffed up, you're talking about a different way of staffing it up, setting up leadership, decision-making. But one way or another, there's this ongoing collaboration in digital therapeutics between product on the one hand and everything around product or therapist or domain experts, right? You have your product people, mm -hmm. game, say product slash games, okay? Because I work in both. So mm -hmm. games. And then there's your scientists. And I have worked with literally dozens of teams in digital therapeutics and seen scientists interact with games and product people. And there are many ways to do that, but there's this kind of existential challenge at the core of this interaction. You're trained, you have an understanding of it, right? But I, mean, yeah. I have a PhD. I got the whole training. You did the whole nine yards. With the scientific method, how far do you extrapolate your results? You did things, you held a bunch of things constant and changed one thing so you could know what had the impact. There's a lot of simple, basic stuff about the scientific method that if you do it right, you're doing science. Okay, now we're outside of the lab, right? And people that do science on human perception, which is actually what my PhD was in. That's what I did research on. You're doing it in a lab with stimuli, right? It's this thing. And then you go out in the world and you're like, okay, I'm going to collaborate with these people that are building this game. As a scientist, there is a whole creative leap and judgment about how much do you stick to the way you did it in the lab, because that's the only thing you can trust. And if you don't do it that way, suddenly it doesn't work. I have seen many scientists wrestle with that in real time. I, I think that's part of it. But here's this interesting barometer we have, this interesting situation that um, we know without question. Today, I'm going to talk about mental health only because I'm not looking at all digital therapeutics, but today, the most wildly successful mental health treatments have been commercially built video games. They were completely accidentally therapeutic. So this is a very Darwinistic approach at the moment. It, it's a lot like someone went out in the forest, they found these mushrooms, some of them killed you, some of them just filled your belly, and in the middle, they found this psychedelic effect that we're now figuring out is has all of these potential therapeutic properties. This is the same thing here. We can have a theory and we definitely want to go in there. And some of the things you're saying about basic scientific intent, it really is change one thing at a time. If you change everything, there's no way of understanding what did what. And I actually have found that good video game designers know that too. Maybe Joe, right? They, they don't come in there and just move everything around all at the same time because they also can't figure out how they're getting their best effect. And these are the masters I'm talking about. 
that really know how to attract an audience, right? So sometimes it happens. It's just like music and it's just, and I think you know this better than you. Sometimes an indie sits down and writes a song and every one of us is like, what happened there? And sometimes they got a deep talent. Sometimes there was a little bit of confluence of luck. Same thing happens in games. There's those people that have built a game, it was a smash hit, but they were not people that could replicate success. Then you've got people like Jeffrey Sant, who he has a track record of being able to replicate success. And he looks a lot like a scientist to me. So we found a lot of confluence in that situation, but also then coming out and taking a look at and going, okay, what's happening here? And what really matters? There's a couple of things we know without question that matter at the moment. You have to be engaged. We've seen that across the board. We know four ways. Yeah. And we know four ways to really, the easiest ways to get a game to be therapeutic are these conflicts between a game and its mechanics in a way that you have motion. So extra games are working really well, right? Distraction. Distraction is working very well at pain management and things like that. Social constructs, just overcoming loneliness alone changes people's mental health. And then biofeedback loops. We can get you to do a thing that gets vagal nerve stimulation right through your body, take breaths, and we'll search especially while you move and do other things as well. We know these all work. The one that's amazing, that's going to take more time to understand is pure play. Because when we look at some of the most remarkable studies, like the one that came out recently on Mario Odyssey, where it's small sample size and it's the beginning of days stuff here. I understand there's more to know, but the bottom line is there was three groups that were given different tasks. One was on drugs and talk therapy. One was doing puzzler games and one was playing Mario Odyssey for six weeks. All of this population was diagnosed and had been diagnosed for a considerable period of time with major depressive disorder, a very hard thing to treat. And in the drugs and talk therapy, really your standard kind of almost no change, which is what we expect in people that have already been diagnosed and had the, the therapeutic response they're going to have. The brain teaser games, they didn't do anything. And that's pretty consistent with a lot of what we've seen about brain teasers. 48% of the people who played Mario Odyssey for six weeks were no longer able to score high enough on a personal inventory that they would be considered to have major depressive disorder. We do not know what all of that is now. But here's the thing that I love about that. Folks are like, it wasn't long enough. What did you say? I'm like, if a pharmaceutical had that kind of response, people would be like, whoa. But when it's a game, the first thing that comes is skepticism. Well, what if they have to keep playing the game for Amy Joe? They have to keep taking the medication forever, right? I think the one thing we know about it is sooner or later, they're going to need another game because we need that dopaminergic response. Once you finish Mario Odyssey, where are you going next? And that's a lot of what we've been changing that approach as well about, right? It's not how do we build the perfect game. It's how do we build the perfect ecosystem that can keep building these games where the agency will give us the approvals we want. The developers will understand what it is they're building and there'll be a reimbursement engine in place where we get compensated for this and we can start to attract who we need to do this work and who we need is the best. The other thing you'll find about the most therapeutic video games in the world is they were created by the masters and the masters get paid for what they do. And when you look at also the things that are worst about video games, it's the monetization schedules. And that really has caused the biggest problem. There's nothing really in a gameplay loop that can hurt you. But if you start using excessively using loop boxing, certainly around dopaminergic response, you have free and unmoderated chat going and using energy dynamics that draw people back into the game to preserve the work and friends and time they've already invested. Those are the things that make games difficult for vulnerable populations and they're tied to monetization. So we need to do this work where the agency understands, the, the game developer understands, and the payer understands, and change the ecosystem so you can get paid to make these things that are really good for folks, keeping new material available all the time, because that's going to be an important part of the ongoing therapeutic. We're going to need things to keep doing. I think we're going to get better and understand ourselves better through play, especially when you don't have a hunch. Many people use games today to already feel better, but it's a hunch. And while they're feeling better, they might get a... a a doctor or a parent or a spouse coming at them going, oh, you're doing this 10 hours a day. Is this really therapeutic for you? I think actually it probably isn't good for you. And then they go off, they go into the drug therapies, they potentially go off into the talk therapies and they have what I'll call the normal response rates, which aren't amazing. They're better than nothing, but they're not amazing. And for some people, that's where they actually get worse is they start to think that they're not really fixable. I was only really good at playing this game. It's only when I felt good. When I actually had to do the real work and did the real medicine that didn't work on me, I'm not good for anything. And they blame themselves instead of blaming a system where they might have already found their key therapeutic in play. And the chances that they were going to stay at 10 hours a day if they were getting proper intervention are pretty well. Typically, we have a healing period. 
we'll see, see people come back down. If they do, then we're at the place of excessive issues. And the game isn't really curative at that point or solving a problem for them at that point. They probably have other cold morbidities that we got to look at and see what's going on, including the idea. There's a lot of depressed and anxious people, Amy Joe, that are the core problems not going away. If you're getting physically or mentally abused on an ongoing basis, uh, you have other chronic issues like pain. And this idea that the, there's a magic bullet that's going to make your life not be the life that's harming you is a, is, a, is a different situation. These are interventions for when you have, are in the middle of or have dealt with the core of the issue and now you're on that recovery path, right? I don't care what medication you're on and I don't care what doctor you talk to. If you're being mentally and physically abused, there's only so far they're going to be able to take you until that abuse is stopped. Yeah. One of my clients who co-developed a, a mental health game as a game from the ground up for teenagers did a project where she took the gameplay to Columbia, the country, and did workshops and worked with kids and caregivers and saw close up close and personal in that situation, et cetera, and just can't solve everything. There's going to be a segment of the population. It's not going to be everybody for whom this could be the right therapeutic. That's right. Early data says this looks more therapeutic than other things we've done. Like it's going to attach itself to a greater level of the population and have a higher degree of success than some of the things we've seen before. Which is if you have a new therapeutic or you have a new drug and you come on the market and you show 30% improvement on major depressive disorder, they're going to approve that in a heartbeat. And I think the other really interesting thing is you're not going to know the mechanism of action when you apply for that. You'll have a theoretical me me mechanism of action. You won't fully know and nor were the agency, but they'll allow us to clear those drugs. And this is the same thing I'm saying about these games. We have to get to the place where we identify what's good for you, what's bad for you, make a toolkit of what's good for you and get comfortable that these are things that deserve a therapeutic label, deserve reimbursement, and really could reduce the cost of healthcare and increase the reach. Like you can't imagine being successful in medical device. You may know this, but when I say I've had hits, I've had hits in the medical device industry enough to retire me. Most of my hits were reaching 100,000 patients a year or or something like that. Maybe in the case of light therapy, we got to a couple million and that was a big deal to have that kind of reach per year. And then you've got 3 million people already on gaming platforms. That's the reach. That And that's the reach it's going to take. If you look at globally what's happening with mental health, it's going to take something like that as an intervention. It, but if we don't take the other ills out of the, we don't solve the political divide issues, if we don't potentially deal with the harms that are going on and the disparity of resources, all these sorts of things. It won't completely be this panacea that solves everything, but it can give you coping mechanisms in the beginning. It can restore us to a place where we were a few years ago, where we're not right on the brink of 50, 60% of our population being stressed, anxious, depressed. Some people say those numbers are 80%. Yes. The last week at the conference, I heard someone suggest they're at 90%. So we can tone it down. And then we can begin to work on the core issues, which is a lot like any therapeutic. And we got to solve for the core issues and use these also as a way to get to know one another, deal with the loneliness epidemic, great, bring greater levels of connection. I think media can have a huge part to play. I don't think anything other than something as powerful as media and story can move the needle. I hope you're right. I think there's a lot of promise. There's one big challenge that I would wager on you're already wrestling with that I just can't help but mention as a game designer, which is the difference between choosing to play a game, the difference between having it prescribed. Now, the Mario Odyssey study is very promising for that reason, but there's a real difference in what you should do and what you choose to do. There's some amazing data yeah, where professors have said, listen, they, they, have, they have said, look, you've got to play Minecraft and you got to build this thing in Minecraft. And all of a sudden it became a chore and, and it broke that whole dopaminergic cycle, that whole, I want to, that sort of thing. I, I think what we're talking about here is actually not that different than what people have been doing anyways, if you be real about it. There's a lot of people playing games to feel better. They go in there to feel better, but if they don't just start having fun sometime after they cross the threshold, like pretty darn quickly, if it's not a really good game, it isn't going to work. So I do grapple with it all the time. I say you'll go in for your mental health, but you'll stay because you're having a good time. 
That's what makes these are not going to be easy things to produce. I know someone has hired you before that said to me, I got to make a hit video game and you look at them and say, I'll give you the best team. I'll give you an amazing premise. I'll give you great testing platforms. And I cannot promise you that I'm going to nail this because there's an art and science to it that is beyond definition. And now we're adding more components to that. It's the same thing with me. I cannot guarantee you that we'll have high adoption rates on a certain therapeutic. I can do my best with all the things we have. And there's a magic component in the middle. I work. The further we get to defining that, the better we do. But that's why it's really going to take, just like it always has, a lot of games and a lot of media too. I don't want to go too far off track, but this does not just apply to video games. Anything that you can become immersed in is something that can get you into this dopaminergic state, can get you a level of visual spatial interference where you're not really cognitively too involved in the moment. And it looks like it starts to heavily accelerate learning and allow you to make memories in a different way that where they become more accessible on a limbic level faster. So it's not like a talk therapy sort of thing where I, I use this example all the time. Somebody walks into a crowd, they hate crowds and they look around and they think, oh, I suck. This is terrible. And they, they go running out of it. They get some talk there being the talk therapist gets them to the place where they understand, look, you've got to think about that differently. So the next time they go into the crowd, same stimulus, same response. I suck. And then they start thinking, oh, okay, maybe I can do this. And oh, it's not just me. Other people have a problem with this. And, and they start using their coping mechanism. When you learn on Olympic level, it's very different. You walk into the crowd, you still don't like it. You get the stimuli, but the first thought in your head isn't, I suck. It's this sucks. Now you're in a very, and then you might also have learned to, for instance, take a few breaths. You start having a very limbic response before you even realize it. You're taking a couple of deep breaths. You're thinking this sucks. And then that puts you in a different place. You're at a different set of memories and thoughts. And therefore you're at a different response rate, in which case you might be able to settle yourself down, stay there. But even if you choose to leave, you don't leave because you suck. You leave because this sucks. And that's a different perception of yourself. And it puts you in a place to be a healthier person. That's the kind of changes I see through media, but only if there's a lot of new media that can reach a lot of people in a lot of different ways. Can you make a living out of developing therapy games? What would you recommend for a therapist who wants to get into the gaming space? Yeah. So let me be really clear. At the moment, it's very hard to make a living. In this. What I see here is a very big industry that is not ready to pop yet. And, and the real challenge is the combination of either doing the video game the way the agency wants it today, which is so expensive that you'd have to sell it for an amount that people can't buy it over the counter and there's no reimbursement. So that's that misalignment we're talking about. We're working on aligning that by reducing the cost of the development and the management of a cleared game and bringing reimbursement to it over time. So I do see a lot of opportunity here. It feels like we're two to five years away from where this becomes a large industry. So that's why a lot of us that are working on this now can afford to really not be in a lucrative environment. Most of Deep Wells, very top people, there's 33 people that sign in every day. You something in a Deep Well, two thirds of them are literally volunteering their time. Right? That includes people like Jeffrey saying, who has come and been successful in the, in the market before. He wants this to the level that he's directing all this work, but he is not taking compensation other than he clearly has ownership that we hope that this will grow and do these things but it's a tough way to make a living so far. Beautiful. So can you describe the Deepwell DTX tech stack? Is it web browser or Unity based, for instance? What are your plans to make the tech stack available to other content producers? That is exactly our plan. Deepwell is building content at the moment so that we can get uh, FDA clearance and the FDA to understand what we're doing. But primarily everything we build, we're not just clearing the games, we're building them as SDKs and we're looking to provide those SDKs Back to other game developers, we like the idea of, of supporting indies as well as the uh, AAA game development in a, in a way that those mechanics can be baked into other games and they allow for a much faster access to um, being cleared. And that allows you to use these actual terms. My video game is good for stress. My video game is good for anxiety. My video game uh, is good for pain or depression. And so we're building uh, this SDK and we're building it to work with Unity and we're building it to work with Unreal. We're doing a lot of work right now that include audio feedback loops and Unreal's new package is, is amazing at that, but both engines are important. The rest of the tech stack is actually really interesting too. On the back end of Deepwell is a quality system that allows a different way of verifying and validating software. Usually the agency wants everything very locked down. 
but our ability is to separate the therapeutic from the rest of the game and allow those parts that are decorative to the game to be iterative, which is what game developers are very used to doing in the engines they're used to doing in it, Unity and Unreal, or even if they're old custom engines or anything else, a smaller engine that they want to use. And really just managing the therapeutic element of the game as the medical device, which greatly opens up the freedom to design and change the game, which is not something you can do. The FDA set up their software protocols around things like pacemakers. They do not want to see iterative chain. They want to see it locked down and controlled. So we've managed to that environment in our tech stack. And we're also managing for deployment. So we're getting the agency to understand that this could go out to many mobile devices at many different platforms and not require every hardware platform to be separately validated. That is a very expensive proposition as well. So a lot of our tech stack is about making the FDA happy with what we're doing and building an environment where video game developers can be video game developers. The efficacy of the games can be managed. Those things that are therapeutic are controlled in a way that they should be controlled, that the risk is managed for safety and effect effectiveness. So it's to build this intersection between media and medicine and provide folks the ability to make a lot of games because that's what it's going to take. It's lots and lots of games that have these labels on them. And then finally, our next trajectory will be to build a referral engine. So when there's enough material out there, we're going to get to know you as a person, a player, your disease state, the equipment at your disposal, and try to find you the best media nutritional path for you, which will include the drugs, so the things that are clear, as well as we'll call them the vitamins, the things that are just recommendation that are more wellness-based, but try to put together for you a therapeutic package. And finally, we're working on reimbursement on the back end of that, which is going to take years. But in the end, we would like to be this epicenter between the tool set that developers can use to build this, a set of services that can help people understand how their game is therapeutic and also when it's harmful, and a way to get access to reimbursement, a new whole way to get paid, right? Which is what will build this immersive medicine environment will change really the employment opportunities across the board in both medicine and really in entertainment. I, I really hope 10 years from now, we'll see the first of a degree, maybe something in Stanford or something like that, where we can work on immersive medicine as a comfort of medicine and media so people come out capable of doing this in a way that that is most effective. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you all. <laughs>